directed and produced a variety of shows. Um, talking about what got you into directing. Okay. Um, so I, as a kid, was making videos. I never had a video camera, but my friends did. So, like, we would make little army videos or for school we would do video projects but I never knew back then being a filmmaker wasn't as out there as it is now like on YouTube and TikTok and that wasn't a thing so I like to write <coughs> so my parents and my family always said like oh you're going to be a writer for advertising you know uh -huh. we didn't know you could write for television or movies or things like that so directing I didn't even know was a job and uh I went to school for communications in English. I did journalism. I was um, a stringer for the New York Times. I was writing on a couple of papers. Um, but I was still making videos with this public relations department. And then I, I saw a movie. It was Peter Pan uh, Hook by Spielberg. I saw it with my girlfriend in junior year. And at the end, I was just like, ah, it'd be fun to make movies. Yeah, yeah. that's a classic. Good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, Smee, right? Yeah. Don't try to stop me this time, Smee, right? Yep. And uh, <laughs> I, I, it was a, that's a fun movie, right? Wish for a film and movie. And my girlfriend at the time said, uh, you should. You'd be great at it. And it's literally the only time in my life that the ceiling separated. Light shone down from the heavens. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I went, oh. So I was, like, uh, applying for advertising internships over the summer because I thought that's what I had to do. And while I was doing that, I started looking into film schools. I ended up going to Parsons School of Design, doing an intensive, like, six-week uh, make a short film program. Did that, started applying to graduate schools, um, and totally changed my course. Um, didn't think I had any chance in hell of getting into film school, not having done anything but my short film and my writing. Got in NYU, though, uh, grad school, and, and went there. And then how'd you land your first, I guess, official directing gig? That's always the question, right? And everybody's, yeah. I ask anybody I meet that question <laughs> even now because there's no, you know, it's not like, well, I got my uh, master's degree. I brought my diploma to, you know, Spielberg and he said, here's your first film. It just doesn't work that way. So I was in NYU grad school. Uh, I wanted to get some experience over the summer. I, uh saw an ad for an intern for a production company. I went to the door. Uh, the guy who opened the door ended up being my business partner for 15 years, but they are making a no budget feature. They brought me in as an intern. And what I didn't know is the producer at the time who wasn't making any money either was about to leave. And she saw me and she was like, oh, this guy's responsible. He can jump in. So she left. They offered me the line producing job. No idea what I'm doing. And I did it. We made a a feature film on 16 millimeter uh, in 13 days and for $40,000, 18 days, $40,000. And I did that. And then they asked me to do a million dollar film as like their location manager. I was like, well, I'm going to take a year's leave of absence, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I stopped and I just promised myself I uh, would go back after a year. After a year, I was like, well, I don't have to pay $30,000 a year at that time, which is now probably 70000 a year to uh, make films when I'm learning from other, I'm learning off of other people and getting slightly paid for it. So I promised myself as long as I would write and, and push my directing. And this company I was with, I, I wrote a feature script, they liked it. They were gonna help me try to make it for like a million dollars. We never got that one made. Um, what was it about? It's about an Irish family in Brooklyn whose life revolves around alternate side of the street parking. So it's a, you know, it's actually, when you look at my career, it's very on brand, but it was what I knew, you know, it's a crazy Irish family. Um, I love jokes. I love jokes and jokes are perfect little stories, which means they're perfect little short films. Cause I think that's the problem with a lot of short films. You're like, how do you tell that story quickly and feel complete? Mm. So I took six jokes of my favorite jokes, a football joke, a what were the first ones? A football joke, a sex joke, a, uh, uh, oh god, I don't even remember what the first six were now, and I did them. They were all different genres, but they were comedies, like two minutes, man walks into a bar, all those, and I made them as like mini movies. And I thought, one, I can 
get these on Comedy Central if, uh, you know, they don't help. And I made them and showed them around, played in festivals. I sent them to HBO because I knew someone who worked for HBO. And in their promo department, HBO said, we want these. It was right after they had started doing Sopranos. So it was, they wanted to do original content and the promo department wanted to do original content. This guy, Mark Rosenberg, said, I want these. And I had all these different other directors attached. Like, I thought I could go to, Indi to the Independent Film Channel or Sundance Channel and have, like, indie directors direct jokes just to try to produce it. And he said, no, I want you to do all these. And so I, my first paid directing gig, writing and directing gig, was a joke, literally a joke. Uh, I made 24 short films for HBO. And even while I was doing the jokes, I wasn't making enough money as a director to not, you know, pay for New York. So I was still location <laughs> managing, okay, line producing, uh, assistant directing. I was a dolly grip. I did sound. So I did whatever I could. But I was making my career. I was making money as a location manager and a line producer for commercials. Television is different than film. I think if you're a film person, you got to rise up and you got to you got to want it. Um, television, you can. It's still hard, but you can fall into it because you were a PA or, and you saw, hey, that would be a good path. Um, and I know some people, a lot of people do theater. I never did theater as a director, but they, that's what got them over the TV and film. Since you're like popular in the like, children's programming, how'd you just get into it uh, and then go forward and, and directing these big shows like uh, Blue's Clues and uh, Big Time Rush? Uh, as well as the Fresh Beat Band, a lot yeah. of music. And yeah, so there are some people that I work with in children's television. I do a lot of children's and family, and I love it. But I never, like, that was never my goal. My goal was to make indie film quirky comedies. That's what I thought I wanted to do. Okay, so I did the jokes, right? And then you're like, well, now what? Yeah. And I looked around, who did I know who needed directors? And a woman who was a production coordinator on an indie film I had location managed worked on Blue's Clues, this new show that was starting up, which then was groundbreaking because uh, it was all green screen. And back then, that people were like, how do you do that? You know, um, I got her my reel and only because I knew people on the production and they said, great. And I went in and that got me into not only green screen and effects, um, mixed with animation, which again, that was never, but I, I have a lot of jobs where that has come in very handy. Um, but it got me into kids TV. So was now, it like a learn by doing? Sorry. Um, yeah. Like it was brand new to you. How, how do you like navigate, I guess, Blue's Clues? Like your first day? Blue's Clues is a very structured, very, I have a lot of jobs that are very difficult to do as a director. They're not like, hey, you have a bunch of adult actors and you're gonna direct the scene however you want to. Like, you, I come in the structured, like, shows that have boxes that you have to fill. So this one was the camera can never move. You had to storyboard every um, angle before you even went in and shot. You had to work with one actor in three minute long takes where they are moving, but the camera's not. It's a really hard show to do. It doesn't look like it, which is the goal, but it's a really hard show. So the prep process was enormous and they had already done it. And so you shadow, right? You go in and see another director do it and you go, okay, I got that. Then you go through the storyboarding process and you got that. So by the time you got to set on Blue's Clues, you would shoot an episode of that. You'd block it for a day and a half so that you didn't wear out Steve, the actor, if he just was acting every day he would have exploded <laughs> so you'd have a couple days a week where you'd block and a couple days where you would just shoot all day and then that led you to working with uh, Nickelodeon and the next show was in a one? curvy way so this you think that oh no-brainer right you look at the credits and go okay Blue's Clues then he must have boom immediately started doing these shows um, I was in the preschool box and the preschool box is different than the 6 to 11 box so I thought it would be very easy to go, hey, let me do your other shows, and it wasn't. Um, so I knew I had these promos from HBO, so I went to HBO, and, I'm sorry, I went to Nick Promos, and it was like, let me do promos for you, and they were like, wow, these are great. But one day a guy wrote and said, hey, I have this idea for a show, it's not really a show, it's promos between shows, but it's a half an hour of scripted uh, comedy, a Saturday Night Live for kids, where the kids pick 
everything in the show. And to this day, this was 2002, it's still the most truly interactive show I've been involved with. Okay. It was called You Pick, and they said, would you pitch on it? So I pitched all these sketches, all this, I just threw it all at them. And they hired me, it was a 10 week experiment. We were, I was the executive producer, writer. I wasn't the director because it was live and I had never done that before. So we had this amazing live director from MTV named Joe Petrella. And we had Britney Spears, Counting Crows, uh, Mike Myers, uh, Seth Green, like anybody who had a kid's show or an album they had to promote would go on TRL and then would come on our show. Oh man, TRL. That was, <laughs> yeah, that was the thing. And we ended up doing 400 episodes of that show. And the way this answers your question, how I got the next gig is, um, any show that Nickelodeon had, all that, um, Ned's Declassified, Zoe 101, those cast members would come on our show to promote their shows, right? That's what we were, we were promo gramming. Yeah. Um, although kids didn't know that. Kids would say that that was their favorite show on Nickelodeon. <laughs> and our cast was as recognizable as anyone else. So I started working with these cast members and creators like Dan Schneider and Scott Fellows, um, but still could not get on their shows because Directing is golden tickets, and it is still, after 30 years, the hardest thing to get a gig. And now that I'm an EP hiring directors, I see how hard it is. There's so few tickets, such a big line, there's schedule, there's network, there's actors that all have input into it. It's really hard to get those slots. So, again, someone has to champion you. That's what I found in this business is someone has to take a chance and say yes or go call someone and say you should hire them. So I'd done Blue's Clues. There was a woman named Brown Johnson who was the head of Nick Preschool and she is just a powerhouse. And I said I'm trying to get on Ned's Classified. She's like I know Scott Fellows and she called him. Literally said you need to hire Jonathan Jones. Didn't say I'd like you to <laughs> talk with this person and Scott I had gotten my reel to him and this and that but he's bombarded. He's got great directors. Met with him. He, I said, did you look at my reel? He's like, no, I'm too busy. But you did Lazy Town, which was another show I did, which we should talk about. Um, oh, yeah, I want to get there because that's a unique show. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but go on. Uh, and he said, yeah, I've seen that show. That show's amazing. And Brown says you're good, and I'll give you one episode. And if you do good, we'll do more. If you screw up, I won't hire you again. That's what he said. He, he and I have done, oh, God. Uh, maybe 70 episodes of television, three series, a movie together now. So um, that's how I got on Ned's. Ned's was a great show. Once I got on Ned's, then I was suddenly in this, okay, he's done premium kids TV. And it was slightly easier to get onto a Disney show or get on a Cartoon Network show, things like that. Is it easy to bounce back between Nickelodeon and Disney? Uh, the people like are they networked in that way to the producers and line producers hop around that okay way. the showrunners don't and the showrunners are really high. the line producers and showrunners are how you get in there actually the show i'm doing right now i was just able to hire the first line producer that helped me get in on ned's declassified and uh, we've worked on a bunch of projects together, but it's been years for a while and the producer dropped out on the really loud house and Deb was available. So it's kind of come full circle because uh -huh. my crew is all the people I met with Deb on Ned's The Classified and Fresh Beat Band. We did all those shows together and now we're all doing a show in Albuquerque together. So that's really nice. Is it easier having the same crew because you each know each other and how you work and it goes more Short, smoothly? Yes. I, I often say like... I'll, I'll, I did a show for Apple, and they were like, I was like, this is my DP, this is my team. And they're like, yeah, we're looking to... Everybody wants the shiny new thing. They're like, what if we get the DP from who shot the second Indiana Jones? And you're like, uh, one, is he going to do this? And two, has he ever done kids television where you have eight and a half hours to shoot a movie? Um, so I often say, like, I can't do what I do without these key collaborators. On the other hand, you're always working with new collaborators, and... And you find, it's kind of like when you're older, you think you don't find any more friends, right? You got your friends, you know, I'm 40, I'm not going to find new friends. <laughs> but then you find that person, you're like, wow, you yeah, got a new, a totally. new friend. You find new collaborators that way, and that's great. And you want to find people that push you, but also compliment you. But 
I could not do the show I'm doing now. The shorthand I have with the production designer, the assistant director, the costume designer, the DP, there's so much time I don't have to spend telling them what I want because they know how I work. So I can say, we're going to do it like that, and they know what I mean, and they do their thing, and we all come together, and then it's like painting. And know? what show is uh, That's this? the Really Loud House for it, Paramount Plus and Nickelodeon. I was asked to bring the um, animated series to life in a Christmas movie as an experiment. Like, can we do this? Everybody's trying to take their properties, right, and franchise them. Yeah. And... So we made a Christmas movie, which was really hard. We brought this family to life. It's a boy with 10 sisters. So I had to cast 13 people in a family um, via Zoom during the pandemic and hope they looked like these animated <laughs> characters and worked together. And it was it was a big success. It was the most watched um, children's show or kids and family show all year of any channel anywhere, which bigger than Kids Choice Awards even. It was like the, so that yeah. was, that was, you know, partly we did a good job, but because it was based on this amazing, you know, animated show. So then they asked for 10 more, uh, turned into a TV series, brought a showrunner on named Tim Hover, who's amazing. He's done Scrubs and In the Middle. And we did 10 in Albuquerque, and they loved them so much, they asked for another 10. We did those. Then they're like, we're going to do a Halloween movie. So we did the Halloween movie, which I just finished editing last night. And we're starting up 20 more for season two next week. Working with kids, though, what do you look for? Like, I'm sure you got both ends of it from, like, kids that are difficult to the easy. Like, what do you look for in casting one as uh, just working with them, too? No, it's a good question because I, I often, like, I got on Young Sheldon because I had worked with kids. I, um, I've had a few network shows that... You know, and they, it, some people talk about kids as if they're like working with tigers. You know, it's like, how do you work? With yeah, kids? You get... I, I would imagine. Yeah, um, I'm a big kid. I always say that, and I identify with kids. If there's an adult party and there's kids there, I'm going to be hanging out at the kids' table. So I connect that way. I don't direct them differently than I direct adults, and and I've directed Academy Award winners. When you're casting a kid, the one thing I want is naturalness, because a lot of times, especially in LA kids have been trained and groomed and they're good but they're they're not natural you want natural and real at least i do not everybody does and then i want to i want to mess with them and i don't mean mess with their minds like they might come in and nail a performance and they've worked on it and they've worked with their mom on it and their acting coach and it's great and it might be right on it might be exactly what i wanted but i will ask them to change it in a work session with them because i want to see what happens if i do that um, can they take a note and change it? And sometimes very good actors can't because they, they worked it so many times they can't hear the note. If they can change it, even if it's wrong, like you watch and go, oh, that wasn't good, but it was the note I gave, then I know they're malleable and open to change. I find sometimes when I work with showrunners, you're like, why'd you do that? I liked it the way I was like, I just want to see what they can do because at some point you're going to be on set and they're not going to be doing it the way you want to and you got to find a way to get them there. And I'm not a, not a say it this way guy, even that's called line readings. I don't like that. I'm a, I'm a tone reading guy. Like I will often say the line back to him. Like the line might be the, the boy is like, um, how are we going to do this? Right. And that's what you want him to do. But he's going, how are we going to do this? Or how are we going to do this? And it's flat. And I won't come in and say, no, you want to be, how are we going to do this? I'll go like, you're like, what is going on? And, <laughs> and I'll say the wrong line, but with the energy that I want and try to get them there. And for kids television, you have to have that like extra level, right? Cause all the shows have like what you're doing or what? Like every reaction is some like amped up reaction sometimes correct? but there's like this show we're doing right now it's very interesting it's a heightened show but we try to actually a lot of the lines are funnier if they're thrown away they're much funnier um so you're battling that sometimes you're battling the opposite way which is someone coming in and doing it too big and you're like no nah, just throw us away it's even better like they're doing it too perfect i've been lucky that i've been on the big preschool shows like imagination movers fresh beat band blues clues blues clues uh, and you couple others um that are live action because some of them are not are still good shows but they're not kind of at that higher level of sophistication mm -hmm. fresh beat band we were doing 
four musical numbers an episode, tons of big gags. I mean, the choreographers were the people who did all the single ladies, who did Stomp the uh, Yard. Uh, Mandy Moore, who did La La Land, she and I worked together on a uh, fresh beat band. On Imagination Movers, I worked with uh, the choreographer we were lucky enough to get. The woman who has directed a lot of the great OK Go videos, the one in the plane. Oh, the those are, yeah. That's Trish. Yeah. You know, I am not trained to be a director, a choreographer, a great choreographer, but her brother is the lead singer of OK Go and she has incredible ideas and so she's done those videos and now she's a, a killing it as a director in her own right, doing movies, doing Pitch Perfect 3. In preschool television, I was working with all these amazing talents, you know, and when you choreograph a music video, it doesn't matter that's for a preschool show, it's still 40 dancers on a street, you know, it's the same as La La Land, you know, yeah. um, and you got to do it in less time and with less money. So. And how do you work with them and what, 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 do you let them like run with their creative mind and coming up with the, the dance or whatever needs to be done and then you kind of just go, hmm, yeah, I like it. Like, how's that? I, that's not me at all, but that is a way you, you, some people do it, which is like, I love music, I love dance. I've done over, probably if you count them up, over 250 music videos, you know, if you consider that, I don't know how many episodes of Fresh Beat Band I did, and there was three music videos an episode, and Big Time Rush, and things like that. But I have specific ideas going in. Choreographers is, a key collaborator who's also should think like a director and a producer, right? Some will like to choreograph as if it's being performed on a stage and then they're like, you shoot it. And I don't ever shoot videos that way. I've done live television, you know, and you need that. You need a number that goes from top to bottom and you have to put your cameras around it. But I like to break it up into vignettes. I like to think about where the camera is, and I like choreographers like Mandy Moore and Trish C. Hopefully you have the song. Sometimes you don't yet. You just have the script, and you're like, so it's going to be this kind of vibe. I'm thinking these kind of things. Here are the things I like. I know I want a shot where I push through the skeletons, and it's a, like a Busby Berkeley zipper line where it's actor, skeleton, actor, skeleton. And a lot of choreographers will be like, that's awesome. And then they'll go and work with... Uh, the dancers and they'll come back and show you something and then you go oh that's great could you add this to it because I'm going to need to have it cut here and I'm going to need to have the camera over there or I don't really want to be doing that during this beat because I know I need to cut to a shot of the dad as a werewolf I'm using the example from the Halloween movie we just did so let's dive into lazy town how, how do you um I guess crazy town um, or Lazy Town, Crazy Town. Crazy, crazy Town's a band, right? Crazy Town's a band. Uh, uh, <laughs> lazy Town. We called it Crazy Town. So, uh, okay. history behind Lazy Town is amazing. So, Lazy Town was created by a guy named Magnus Scheving, who was the 1995 European Aerobics Fitness Champion. Oh, man. He looks like Danny Kay, gorgeous guy, but he, and he got into that. Uh, as a whim, someone was watching ESPN like three and like, look at those crazy guys doing like flying cartwheels and jumping jacks and fitness. He's like, I could win that. <laughs> and then for two years trained and did that. Oh, but man. fitness and health of children is really important to him. So he started a puppet show, then a play in Iceland. And then he just had the vision to say, this could be big. So I heard about it. They shot this trailer on film that looked like nothing I'd ever seen. And this was back in, uh, this would have been 2002. And I saw the trailer and I said, I want to work on this show. Cause there were things in it that I didn't know how to do, right? So as a director, you're like, I want to figure out how to do that. How'd they do that? It's giant um, puppets that look real. It's people with prosthetic makeup that look fake. It's action, it's uh, green screen comping. So they came to me and asked me to produce it. And I looked and I just went, this will be miserable to produce. This is insane. It's in Iceland. It's with this technology no one's ever used before. It was using Unreal Engine. Oh, man. Which I didn't know was Unreal Engine at the time. Um, so I kept saying no to producing it. They wouldn't consider me as a director because Magnus has, was like, I want the best. So he was going to the, Mu the Muppet movie directors, the people who had done big movies. That's who he wanted. Um, and I just patiently brown who got me brown johnson who got me in on neds i just kept saying i'll be there if you need me i'll be there and one day i got a call and he had 
gone through all the directors. He, uh, they were figuring out this process and he wasn't happy. And he said, Brown says you're good, come and do a two week experiment, we'll see. Again, so I got on a plane, went to Iceland. Um, the second day I was there, he walked in, Magnus, he's also the star of the show, and he was doing stunts where he hangs upside down, he does a ton of stunts. And they're like, uh, Magnus can't direct, you should direct this. So suddenly I was directing this Icelandic crew, um, lots of yelling and screaming because it was a stunt <laughs> where he'd like bungee jumping over the floor. A lot of, I, I learned my first Icelandic term because they kept saying hunkalinki, hunkalinki. And I was like, does hunkalinki mean he doesn't want to hang upside down too long? And they're like, yeah. And I directed it and I jumped in and like at the end of that day, the producer was like, so you're going to be on here for the next nine months. I was like, I got to go home and pack. <laughs> <laughs> or go to Walmart. Uh, and they were right? like, go, how long do you have to go home for? So I went home. Packed up, went back. Magnus and I were the only directors on that show. Um, so he, he's the guy with the chin? No, that's Rob, Robbie Rodden. That oh, was okay. an amazing person and actor named Stefan Carl, who unfortunately passed away from pancreatic cancer about oh. five years ago, which is a bummer. But Magnus is Sportacus. Okay. So he is a force of nature. He would be writing till four in the morning. I'd get calls going, Magnus was working with the writers too late. You're going to direct tomorrow. And that show was another show. Every frame was storyboarded because we were shooting in Unreal. So the puppets were real. Some of the set foreground pieces were real. Everything else was Unreal Engine, a game engine. And the cameras, we would sync up and we would live composite that show. So what you see at the end is what we were shooting there. Obviously we tweak a little bit, you color correct, but the camera would move, the background would move. Um, so my Blue's Clues skills, like, amped up, right? You had to take a camera that you didn't move, and now you had to create a camera that did move, but oh sync with the live background. The puppets don't have legs, but the show's all about fitness, right? right? So he's jumping and running. So you're either on platforms where the puppeteers are standing so that he can stand on a floor and you can do head to toes, or you're on the ground and you're having to try to figure out how to create this action show where you can't show you know, below this guy's waist, I would shoot models, I would shoot, um, it was almost, it, up until recently, it was the hardest show I'd ever done still, you know, 20 years later, that was director training for me, because I was in Iceland, I had to figure out puppets, I had to figure out action, you're working with some of Jackie Chan's stunt people, you had to direct people in a different language, um, so looking back, great. like, you really appreciated just having that opera it's a right place right time i would say right patience right place right time but patience you know knowing that i did not want to do the producing of it i didn't want to be a producer producers are headaches that i don't like i like the <laughs> headaches of directing and having the ability to say no even though it was an amazing project like i could have said i'll go ahead and produce and then i'll get a directing spot which might have happened but i knew i would when i produce i take all the stress of the production on me um, when I direct, it's it's a clearer thing for me. It's problem solving. It's I know I can do this. So you mentioned Young Sheldon, but you were in the kids space. How did you kind of did you want to like branch into uh, directing adults and like sitcoms? For sure. And uh, how did you go about doing that? Was it kind of just networking? It is, it was way harder than I thought it would be. So once I directed and I had some really solid stuff under my belt, I was like, all right. And I, had, I got an agent, got a manager, you know, got some meetings at network. I was put in the kid space and a lot of the people you're meeting with haven't watched what you do. So they don't even know, they just think kid show. And they think, you know, as you talked about heightened and big reactions and garish color and like over the top stuff like that and that's not what I was doing. I was being given kids work because of my work in the jokes for HBO and in film where it's like wow you make things look good and you make them look adults. I just want to tell good stories that's literally I'm a storyteller and if it's a great kid story I want to tell that if it's a great murder mystery adult story I want to tell that it was hard to get people to consider me because I had kid credits. Then I started to run into people who were executives who had kids and could be like, you did Lazy Town, you know? <laughs> or you, go, you, yeah. did, you did Neds and Classified, that's a hard show. The people who knew, and then what I was up again at that point was, okay, and then I had to get to the showrunners who don't really know me, and if you show them a kid show, they're immediately thinking about their show. And so 
this doesn't look like my show and they don't understand that I can do a ton of different genres. The break into network was really, it took, I thought it would take a couple of years. We worked on it for about 10 years. So from about, oh no, it was a little less than 10 years, it seems like. In my first network break was a bunch of my, so the crews you work with, they're working yeah. from every show. No one goes, you're a boom operator on a, a kid's show. You can't boom operate a network show. DP, same thing. You're moving through everything. So my friend who's now shooting The Really Loud House, he's on um, Modern Family. He's like, you'd be great on this show. Um, he would bring me over. I'd meet the producers and I'd shout, uh, not just visit him. I wouldn't shout on directors. Um, couldn't get in there, but he kept wanting me to meet this line producer uh, who is an executive producer. And he's a, does Modern Family and all the other shows and has helped create this style of cross shooting and in comedy and half hour comedies. I won a DGA award for directing the movie slash pilot of a hundred things to do before high school. Okay. Which that one awesome. was like a Wes Anderson, um, uh, John Hughes type of story. And we really wanted to make it look like that. So it won, which I was very proud of, but then, you know, I'm up there giving an acceptance speech in front of Spielberg and Wes Anderson and Clint Eastwood and everybody in the industry. And I mentioned how what we do is hard. I was very proud that I won in that category because, um, isn't it amazing just being in, like, you know, from when you started, you just have like a, a shock when you're on stage, like, we have the is not luckiest really job. <laughs> no, luckiest job in the world, the best job in the world. But the, you know, I think some people apologize for being a kids director and I never do because what I do is harder than what most directors do because I have inexperienced actors, lower budgets and less time. And I'm trying to make, so I got up and gave a speech that wasn't like, fuck you, but was like, I'm so proud to be here because a bunch of people in this room, your kids and family movies are the reason I'm a director, ET, you know? So I was celebrating the stories that we tell and I got a lot of positive feedback from that. But then I made a joke where I said, what we do is really, we wanted to do Wes Anderson and he was nominated for Hotel Budapest that year oh, and I was like and what we do we came close but we call what we do Les Anderson <laughs> um, and it's really hard to do what he does which is symmetry and and that symmetry doesn't happen easily but we did it this guy Jeff Morton who is this producer I've been trying to meet with and you know said hey I want Jonathan to meet with you and he's like is he the guy that gave that speech he made the Les Anderson joke. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, sure, I'll meet him. Went in, had one meeting with him. And again, it's a champion. He said, okay. And he was a guy who had enough power and um, and confidence to say to the showrunner of Life in Pieces, we're going to give him a chance. So I got Life in Pieces, which is a show with Academy Award winners, Diane Weist and Colin Hanks and the, a cast of 13 and a few kids in it. And ironically... I got the episode that they break it into like four different stories, Life in Pieces. I got the episode that had a whole kid story, which again scared all of them because they looked and like, kid time, how are we going to do this? And she's, and I wasn't, but I was like, I don't want a kid story. I want to do a Diane Wee story, which I got to do. Um, but and, you're like, oh, I'm a professional. <laughs> I, that didn't scare me, you know? And so I did it and it immediately I was asked back again. Is the pressure high though? Do you feel like, I'm sure you're, you're the director, but I mean like going on to a new show for the first time, what's going through your mind or is it you're just so focused and you kind of... The first like, episode is total pressure. It's a test, right? It's like a first date. You, you, you don't know how the show works exactly. Um, luckily, I've been around enough that there's crew members on every show that I meet, and, and that's just like a little bit of approval because everybody asks, you know. I remember one of the fourth or fifth shows I went on at one point, I got on, and the boom operator came up to me and said, Blues Clues. And I was like, what? <laughs> and this is like, he, I, they all IMDb you. Who's this director, right? Yeah. I don't know. And so they're going in going, oh, this is a Blues Clues director. Why the hell is he going to do here? Whereas what they don't see is all the experience I've had for 30 years as a producer and a director. So you go in, you have to prove yourself. First, you have to prove yourself to the crew because that's the first thing in the morning, right? First day you're going out and you have to do a blocking with the actors. You do that blocking. Hopefully the actors don't, you know, like give you a little shit. Like, I don't want to <laughs> do that. I want to walk over here. Hopefully you've thought that out, but you're also prepared for if someone doesn't like your idea and you go, okay, well then we'll do that. That works great. And you, you show them that you're collaborative and you want to hear what they have to say and you know what you're doing. 
and then you're with the crew. Okay, let's set up the camera here, let's do this. And they need to know that you have confidence. They don't wanna smell fear. Um, but you have to get 150 to 200 people who don't really know you to run up a hill with you, you know? And that I love, but that is very stressful. And then the showrunner is looking to see if you get what he or she has written. And if you capture that, that's your minimum. But hopefully you show them something else. You know, you're not trying to change their words or go, listen, my directing made it better, but you're hopefully do something where they go, I love that he did that. That was even funnier. You know, if you get one or two of those on your first episode, your first episode is to get asked back. The second one is that much easier. And, but you're still learning. And the third one is where you're like, I know how to do the show. I know all the pieces and I fit in. Got it. And some people don't know that like features and TV directing, it's two different things. Like you're saying for television, you're dealing with the showrunner, your, your creative decisions aren't like just you. Cause for a feature, it's pretty much you deciding. TV still. is the writer's medium and uh, film is the director's medium. So I did a show called Fred which had already been a movie, but they wanted to make a show. And I was like the, the main director on it. And then in the middle of it, they're like, we're gonna do a feature. Will you do the, uh, the no, what was it? The camp movie. And I was like, sure. And the same crew was all there and we're in the van and we've been scouting, doing eight episodes of TV. And I remember the production designer was like, we're talking about the movie now. We're on the scout for the movie. And the production designer goes, well, I think, and the producer being funny, but also being, he's like, well, it doesn't really matter what you think. This is a movie, it matters what he thinks and pointed to me. And the whole <laughs> dynamic of a group changed because it really is on a feature, people are going, what do you want? How do we do this? What is your vision? Um, on a television show, they're turning to the writer, the showrunner and going, what do you want? Now I've been lucky in that I'm kind of a showrunner director on a lot of projects now. So I'm collaborating with those writers and some writers are very specific they know visually what they want and others are like i did these words how do they how do we best get it across and i've been very lucky to connect with a bunch of showrunners who really trust me and go and say do your thing you're going to make it great i know it showrunners they they decide your fate right on a tv show at that point in, on. in the end so if you, you get on a tv show if they like you Hopefully they're a powerful enough showrunner and care enough to like fight for you. But here's here's the deal. So I did Outmatched, right? I did the pilot. Network loved me, actors loved me. I think the showrunner liked me a lot. He had other directors he had worked with on the four other shows, so of course he wants to get those in, you know? But then there's a 13 episode order, one of those, the pilot side one. Then there's those golden tickets again. So there's the person that the studio has a deal with, right? They're already paying to be a director in their stable. So that's money they've already spent. Let's bring that director in. Obviously they like that person. There's that the showrunner wants to bring in. And then especially the last five years, but for as long as I've been trying to get in, the push for inclusive and diverse voices, which is very important as part of that. A lot of white guy directors, right? Like that was all of Hollywood for so long. And then some white women. And now it's like, hey, we need to get people of all shapes, sizes, colors, ethnicities, backgrounds, sexuality in there. So then there's a push to have some of those slots be equitable that way. So all of a sudden, 12 episodes, you think, if I directed the pilot and everybody liked it, you would think, oh, he's, he's going to get half of them. It used to be I'd get most of them. You know, there used to be one director for a sitcom because you shoot week to week. You don't have to have two directors. So you would see like um, all, How I Met Your Mother has an amazing director. I think she's directed 70 to 80 percent of all those, you oh, know. Um, well, same with all those TGIF shows, right? Yes. Like Boy Meets World. Yep. Like they have the same director. Sitcom, you, you start on Monday. That's the difference. A sitcom, Monday you do a table read. You rehearse, get a new script on Tuesday, you rehearse, Wednesday you rehearse, Thursday, Friday you shoot, then you start again. A single camera show, uh, half hour, you're prepping, I'm prepping the next episode because there's locations, there's um, schedules, there's things like that while a director is shooting. And then I, while I shoot, another director preps. Uh. So you have rotating directors. And now they we do a thing for money called to save money block shooting where I'm directing two episodes at the same time 
So if we're in the living room, we'll shoot the scene from 101 and then go change, come back. Now we're going to shoot the scene in the living room from 102. Oh. So you're block shooting. So it's a month, uh, two weeks of prep, two weeks of shooting. And then another director comes in. A showrunner wants a director who they know because they can relax. And now that I've been a showrunner a bunch of times, like you're like, oh gosh, is uh, there's a comedic scene this director is going to be there. I want to be around just to make sure it comes off. And especially writers who want their words represented correctly. You know, I'm, I'm, I want that, but I'm also visually the style of the show we created for the Really Loud House is very specific. So I put together a director's guide. All the shows I do the pilot on, I do a director's guide, which is, hey, this is the vision for the show and this is the techniques we use to do it. Now, each director is going to bring their own, his or her, feel or vibe to it but you want it to feel consistent and so I do that document some people I think see it and go great I'm going to do that and others don't but I'm going to create that for the showrunner for the crew and for the directors coming in so they have something to go on but a lot of the directors are the same directors and that has been the problem with getting new voices in here because it's very stressful um there's a lot of money I mean two to $10 million now, you know, on episodes of television, and this person can sink the ship, although you have a whole crew that's not going to let you do that. If the director doesn't make the showrunner's job easier or the line producer's job easier, then everybody has to work harder. You want to come in and make everybody's life easier and have them go, when Jonathan's here, everything goes smoothly and we get a great episodes and the actors are happy and the crew's happy. That's what you want to have. How do you deal with, like you mentioned before, like actors that aren't easy to work with? It makes it any crew member that is like that. And sometimes it's a DP, sometimes it's uh, maybe a writer or a showrunner, um, but actors can, and I've been very lucky. I mean, I love actors. I love actors. I'm amazed at what they do. So there's an appreciation there and a respect for what they do. I have had actors with chips on their shoulders and I won't say who but <laughs> they make it a little miserable to come to set and then you you hear about stories on bigger things you know of, of actors who were miserable or two actors who would not talk to each other and um, I've been very lucky to not have had much of that at all I can probably count I can count on one hand on a shows I've done I can count on two fingers like problem actors you give everybody a benefit of doubt that they have an off day but there were some things that were done and I was like yeah you're just not a good person or you're miserable um, there was one show that was really hard because the main actor felt like he didn't want to be there oh, man. and he and it made things really not fun when this job should be fun it's hard but it's the best job in the world and if you're not having fun doing film and TV then go do something else you know because it's way too hard way too competitive one of my favorite shows uh you did the pilot for tosh.0 oh my how'd god that go? yeah. like how how did that come about <laughs> so here's how tosh.0 happened for me uh and it's again an example of this is how your career goes i had a general meeting at comedy central your agents and managers are trying to get you generals and usually what those are is hi uh, this is me this is what i do you talk Usually, if they're not interested, it's a 15-minute meeting. Like, you can see them, like, <laughs> at about 15 minutes going, all right, if it's good, it's, like, half an hour. I've been lucky I've had, like, 45, 50 minutes because I have a lot of cool stories because I've done different things. Um, and I always have visual aids to show, and, and I love those meetings. I loved dating when I was dating. Everybody's like, I hate first dates. I love talking to people, you know, so <laughs> yeah. I love that. Going to a meeting at Comedy Central with three people, I never met before. My manager had set it up. One of them, Zoe Friedman, whose dad was Bud Friedman, the head of like comedy in LA. And we just talk. And I had done Lazy Town. And I had broken Lazy Town, the process that we did, and showed them. I had a cool video which showed the storyboarding to what we were shooting and how it was happening to visualize it. And they were fascinated by it, because I'm fascinated by it. They said, this is very interesting because we are, have a project that we want to do on green screen and we want to make a little slicker than the usual thing um, we're gonna call you I leave that meeting and m normally you do a general and maybe you run in that person in a year and a half um, you don't get hired from a general right they just know of you so if a show comes up and they call the network and say hey Jonathan's being considered they're like oh I, I met him once okay consider him 
you get on a list. They have director lists. Okay. So you're trying to get on their lists that of, of approved directors. They call and say, hey, we have this project. And they want it to be talk soup, like Joel McHale was doing. But they wanted it to be slicker and interactive, like he was inside an iPad. <laughs> so that's uh, Tosh, Daniel could go, boom, and things would move. All right? Oh, okay. I get on the phone with Daniel and the showrunner. Um, and we have a phone call. I'm in a Nickelodeon conference room. I know because I have this meeting and I'm working on a Nickelodeon promo or something and I'm in there and I talk to them and they're like, great. And they wanted to do it live in front of an audience so that the audience was seeing what all these interactions were. Okay. That was what was tricky about it. So I got the job because I had done Blue's Clues and Lazy Town. That's how I got Tosh.0. Oh, now, yeah. would you ever predict that? Would you ever say I'm going to take Lazy... Uh, Blues Clues, then I'm going to do Lazy Town and maybe I'll get this comedy. <laughs> so what was great is I was there as they were figuring out that show. It had been workshopped by, it was an idea by an executive at, um, at Comedy Central. And then it had been workshopped and he had done a live performance. At that point, Comedy Central would do, do it on, on a live show. So they did it in the theater. And he showed clips on a television and he talked and it was very good. But now they wanted to do a presentation pilot, which is how they screw you from paying you a real rate. They go, oh, it's not for air. Oh, man. So we, the amount of money I got offered, which I won't say, was ridiculously low. But they knew I wanted it, right? Yeah. Because I had all these kids things, but not an adult thing. So I'm like, I'm doing it. I think we bumped them up a little bit. But it was... <laughs> The DGA deal for presentation pilots is basically whatever you want to offer if they want to accept it. So um, I had to work with Tosh and the writer, and we were, they were developing what that show would become. I did the first uh, Web Redemption, oh, which man. was with Afro Ninja, <laughs> which that clip was viewed so many times at that point. He was the stuntman auditioning for a LeBron James commercial and knocked himself out with nunchucks oh, and yeah. fell over. So we go to his house, and... I was a big part of here's how our web redemption will go. We'll show, we'll shoot, we'll do verite, and then we'll give him the chance to do it again. And I did like the whole slow motion, him doing his <laughs> flip, and we played cold play for it. Like I picked that song and put it in, and they were like, yeah, let's use it. Um, so I did that, and then I had to figure out how to do live show, and that's really stressful for me because it was not in my wheelhouse as a director to call, you have to call live. So you gotta go, okay. You know, roll the tape and hit that. Go to camera two, go to camera one. <clears throat> I could do that with like seven cameras, but it, if I mess up in front of a live audience, um, that's stressful, you know? Totally. So, so that was stressful. I did that pilot, I delivered it. It looked like he was in an iPad. It was slick, it was moving. There were screens behind him. Like when he said web redemption, there was like 400 little digital screens of the web. And the note from the network was it looks too good for our air oh man which they're right like comedy central doesn't have super slick stuff like that or at least in 2008 nine doesn't right yeah so then they went back to just him in front of you know like a house so they changed the background every time and they made it less tech intensive that was great you know and they and then they took and redid the episode for air I wasn't available, but they used my Afro Ninja thing, and so I did the pilot. That went for like 500 episodes. Guess who got nothing? Oh, man. Because it was a pilot presentation. I didn't have a percent. Usually when you do a pilot, you get a, um, a, a royalty yeah. of every episode okay. that's made or a, a, a percentage of the show. So like James... Uh, the guy who directs everything from Cheers to Friends and everything, that guy just gets checks and checks and checks because he's been there at the beginning of so many integral series. That's one I wish I was like, oh, I wish we had negotiated. If I, if I had negotiated $100 an episode if it went to series, right? And why didn't you, I guess, did you direct any more episodes? No. no? Very interesting thing. When they went to series, they went... They tried with me and they liked it, but they brought in a live director, you know, because oh, they okay. want it. And again, it's like, oh, you don't fit this box. Also, I, I will say that the execs were like, I don't think Jonathan wants to do this. So they made that choice for me. But of course, I would have gone in and done the beginning of that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, but I didn't. But I always forget that I did that pilot. I, I have like, I think I've done 
19 pilots and 17 have gone to series. So that's like this great record my manager is always touting. And I, every once in a while, I have to go back and try to figure out what those pilots are. And I, I usually forget Tosh.0. As we're coming to an end, I, I want to thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. This and, was awesome. Uh, hopefully we could do it again. Yeah. Cut.